1. I'm female, 4'11 in height, and I believe the fact that my parents raised me like they did saved my life one day. My dad was a lieutenant at a prison, and he was a marine, and he is what many consider paranoid, but to me, I think he's being smart. He deals with the worst human beings alive on a daily basis. He knows what they all did to be in there, and he will do anything to make sure we are not victims to people like them. My mom is no slouch either in the protecting your family department. She worked at a state job and would sometimes get mailed things like tongues as evidence to some crime. So she knows what's really up. I grew up on kind of a short leash, by the way. But hey, it's understandable. So many people I have known don't seem to have any sense of the danger they are actually in by not knowing what is going on around them. When I was about 27, I was living in a neighborhood that was sketchy. But it was a gated apartment, which made me feel safe. I was driving home with my then three-year-old son. And from down the street a ways, I noticed a guy jump over the fence to my apartments. No huge deal there, but... I took note of his appearance and drove into the parking lot as he disappeared behind one of the buildings. I got my son out of the car and told him to stay very quiet and stay right next to me. I didn't really think anything was going to happen at all. But I had to do what I had to do. I was in protective mode. I walked carefully from the parking lot to the first building and stopped. I scanned the complex for him and saw no one. I then walked as quickly to the stairs that led to my apartment. I scanned for him as we made our way up the stairs, just in case he was up there on the landing, but he wasn't. To give you a clear picture, there are stairs that lead up in between two separate buildings and two doors to two apartments on each side. It's pretty cool. People hang out up there and just talk or the kids play. It's covered, carpeted and really nice. So I had my son walk with me up the stairs, and when I saw that there was no one up there, I got us to the door pretty fast. Looking behind me several times as we approached the door, mine was the furthest one on the left. I already had my key in my hand, ready to go in the lock. I want to stress again that I figured I was being silly, but it's the way I prefer to conduct myself, as if the worst could happen. I mean... Most people probably wouldn't have been on alert about this guy. He was probably just trying to see a friend or something. As I was unlocking my door, even though there had been absolutely no sound from the normal, the very noisy stairs, I looked back just one more time, which really was an unnecessary step. Since any time someone goes up or down those stairs, it reverberates in the floor, and the railing creaks. But I look back anyway. I see the guy's bald, dark head at the stairs. He was halfway up them and looking right at me. He had snuck up them so carefully that the stairs didn't make a sound, and I didn't feel the floor vibrate. He was sneaking up on me and my son. Then that moment came, the one you have played out in your head a million times, but doubted that it would ever actually happen. He charged. I got my key in and out, Opened the door, basically threw my boy in, and jumped inside as this fucker was crossing the twenty feet or so between us. And locked the metal screen storm door, just as this guy's hand came for the handle. I shut the solid wood inside the door, and looked at him through the peephole. And he moved away from my door a couple feet, and was looking over my railing that my door and the door across from me butts up against, with a view of the street below. As if he came up there, just to gaze down from there, like, Hey, I was trying to attack you and your boy, but wow, my my. This really is a lovely and interesting view you have up here. I wanted to yell at him, and to open up the wood door and talk all the shit in the world. There's no getting past that metal outside door. But I thought better of it, because I wanted to be forgettable above all else so he would not think of me ever again. But I was so fucking mad. He left quickly after that. So here's why I think the way my dad raised me saved me that day. 
that seemingly unnecessary glance back as I was unlocking my door. Nine out of ten people would have been happy to unlock their door without that glance back. Or even being on point at all for that matter. But not this one. I got that from my father. And it saved us from whatever that piece of shit was trying to do. I've always wondered what exactly that is, by the way. What was this dude in a white wife beater with a beer belly planning to do to me that would involve my son? He was coming after a woman with a three-year-old boy. What was he planning to do with him? Part of me wishes so badly that I knew, but part of me is thankful that I don't. That was the creepiest part of the whole thing, the fact that he was going to come at me while I was with my little boy. I have moved out of that neighborhood, and have never had anything like that happen since. So I'm glad to report that this story has a happy ending. Make careful decisions and stay paranoid. It could save your life. 2. The first part of my story is actually one my grandma, Anne, told us back when I was about 17 years old. We would go around to hers every weekday for dinner on a Wednesday. The last time we visited, she was a little shook up by a very vivid dream that she had. She had been woken up in the middle of the night, and she couldn't understand why, until she noticed an extremely bright light filling the bedroom. It didn't wake up my grandfather, who was fast asleep and had very advanced Alzheimer's. She got up and left the room to find out where the light was coming from, and went into the spare bedroom overlooking the front garden. The light was brighter here, so bright that she couldn't see the source. It made her feel very uneasy, and for some reason, the first thing she said to it was, No, I'm not ready to go yet. At this, the light vanished and everything was dark and back to normal, with just the streetlights outside the windows. She told us that it was how real the dream had been which was what made it so memorable and scary. But after all, it was just a dream. A week later, my grandmother was found dead in her bed. She had a sudden arrhythmia in her heart, and there was nothing we could have done about it. As you can imagine, we were all devastated by the sudden loss, she was only in her sixties at the time, so quite young, and it was the first death of a close family member we had experienced. I'm twenty-eight now, and I still wonder whether it was that her dream had been real, and why she had decided a week later that it was now time to go. A few days after her death, we were all distraught over our loss, and I had been crying before bed every night. I had finally gotten to sleep. And it being the middle of summer, I had my foot sticking out of the bedsheets to keep cool. I woke when I felt someone stroking my foot in a soothing sort of way. I thought it may be my mum, so I raised my head and looked down to the bottom of my bed. There I saw a completely black figure leaning over my bed. I couldn't make out any facial features, but I knew it wasn't my mum. This wasn't something I experienced a lot, so naturally I was terrified. And before I knew what I was doing, I dove under the covers and shut my eyes tight. After a while, and after I calmed down, I began to think, what if that was my grandma? After this, I did come back out of the covers and look around, but no one was there anymore. And I just went back to sleep. Part of me would like to think that it was all just a dream, but I know the feeling of a hand on my foot was real. And there was someone there, I just know it. But they haven't been back since, so maybe I scared them off with my reaction. The end to this story is one more dream that my grandma's younger sister had, not long after the funeral. It was near the end of September that we had the funeral because... The coroners had spent more time trying to prove that my grandfather had murdered my grandmother, rather than trying to find out what actually had killed her. Anyway. My sister and I were back at school, and my mom has suggested that we draw pictures and maybe write her a goodbye letter, since we hadn't got to say it in person, and this might help us grieve. 
I was quite good at art. And did a pencil drawing of a photograph of her at my mother's wedding, and wrote her a letter. My little sister did something similar, and we both put them in envelopes, so no one else could read them, as they were for grandma only. My mum had our letters and my cousins placed in the coffin and buried with her. A few days after the funeral, my grandma's sister came to see us and told us about a dream she had where my grandma was sitting in her garden and reading through our letters with tears in her eyes. What made this especially strange was the fact that my aunt described each piece she had, including the drawing that I had done, which I know no one else would have seen. A few years later, my grandfather, who was now in a nursing home, had caught pneumonia. My mother stayed with him until the end. By this time, he hadn't known anyone's names or faces for a good many years, including my grandmother's. My mom said that when she was with him, he was getting very agitated, probably from fever, and he was lying on his back and kept reaching up at the ceiling, saying, Annie, Annie, over and over. Soon after that, he passed away. We like to think that she came back to look after him in the end. I hope my grandmother and my grandfather are now at peace together, despite what their loss did to my family, and I hope they visit me again someday. 3. The following story happened to me when I was about 12 years old. I grew up in a large farmhouse and had a large family consisting of six kids two parents, and a St. Bernard. As you can imagine, our house could be pretty hectic sometimes. Normally, all the kids had their own rooms to sleep in. Anytime we had guests over at our house, however, one of the kids would be forced to give up their bedroom. On this particular weekend, my uncle and aunt were staying at our house, so my brother and I were the first ones to have to sacrifice the comfort of our bed and be forced to sleep on the couch. My brother decides two people on one couch is going to be too crowded and opts for the floor of the spare bedroom, which doesn't actually have a bed in it. The couch I'm sleeping on is in the biggest room in the house, which pretty much connects to all other rooms on the first floor. I fall asleep pretty quickly and without incident. It's around 1 to 2 a.m. when I wake up, having to go to the bathroom. Now the bathroom is behind a door in the side of a hall, which leads to a very dark and very creepy basement. Sorry if that's confusing, but basically, in order to get to the basement, you have to go down a hallway beside the bathroom. So I go to the bathroom. And right about as I'm finishing up, I hear footsteps walk beside the bathroom door, heading towards the basement stairs. I'm immediately put on edge because it's so early in the morning, and my family tend to be heavy sleepers. As if to reinforce my unease after hearing the footsteps, my Saint Bernard, who was a puppy at the time, goes crazy and runs through the hallway and down the stairs after whoever, or whatever, went down the hallway. This is extremely unusual behavior for our normally friendly and docile dog. It's one of the few times I can remember him barking at anything in his life. And this time he was going fully berserk. I knew he certainly wouldn't act that way if anyone we knew had gone down the hallway. Considering all this gave me a feeling which I now know to be a cocktail of fear and adrenaline. I would likely have shit myself right then and there if I hadn't just finished up doing so. After the fear faded slightly, I decided to make a break for my parents' bedroom and wake them up. I gathered up the courage to do so, and sprint down the hallway, and up the stairs into my parents' bedroom, waking up most of the household in the process. I tell my dad what happened, and at first he didn't believe me, but the odd barking from our dog makes him consider the fact that there could be an intruder in their house. My dad takes a baseball bat, and heads through the hallway, and down the basement stairs, and into the dim and creepy basement. After clearing the basement and finding no one, and nothing even out of place, my dad returns a little pissed off that I woke him and the family up for nothing. He does mention that the basement door, which leads to a pit outside, was nailed shut as he had left it for some time. 
there was no way someone got out of the house through it. There was also a plexiglass window in the basement, but a person couldn't get through that without destroying the window and the frame. The window was also fine. I've never been able to determine exactly what I heard that night, but given previous experiences in that same house, I'm fairly certain it could have been something paranormal. 4. This is more my father's story, but it traumatized me pretty badly as a child and gave me months of nightmares, sleepless nights, and paranoia about myself and my family being killed. Before I recount the actual story, I need to provide a bit of background info. My mother is English, but my father is from a different country in Europe that I won't name here. They met when she was on holiday over here in 1980, had a long-distance relationship, and got married in 1984. My mother moved here after they were married. One of my father's friends and workmates, Egbert, which isn't his real name but rhymes with it, <laughs> also ended up marrying an English woman in 1985. He moved over there and they lived in Gloucester. All of this is relevant to the story. A couple of weeks before Christmas in 1991, my father decided to go to England in order to buy some things he required for work, which were cheaper at this specific warehouse than they were over here. My mother and I were initially keen to go with him, as at that time here, a man who shot his brother-in-law and friend in our local area was at large, and both of us were afraid he'd break into our house while my father was away. But as I'd not long been sick and had time away from school, I couldn't take more and so we had to stay behind. My grandma, who lived in Wales, was coming to spend Christmas with us too. So my father decided to go over to England, buy the things he needed, stay a couple of days with Egbert and his wife, then go down to Wales and to the airport with my grandma, so they could travel here on the same day, even if not on the same plane. So that's what he did. Everything went normally. Nothing terrible happened to him or my grandma or my mother and I while he was away. In fact, nothing happened at all until 1994, when my parents and myself were visiting my mother's family in Wales, and Frederick West's face flashed across the TV screen during the evening news. My father swore loudly in his first language, and then asked my grandma if he could use her phone. He called Egbert. Then, when he hung up, he explained everything to us. Frederick West and his wife Rosemary were convicted of raping and killing at least 12 young women, including their own daughter who disappeared in 1987. The majority of the murders occurred between May 1973 and August 1979, in their homes at 25 Midland Road and later 25 Cromwell Street in Gloucester, with many bodies buried at or near these homes. There were also Egbert's neighbours from across the road. On my father's final night in Gloucester back in December 1991, he and Egbert had been going out for something to eat, and on their way out, met Frederick in the street. He was going for a pint at a nearby public house. My father and Egbert wound up having a drink with Frederick before they went to eat at a nearby restaurant. So Egbert and his wife had been living across the street from two of England's most infamous murderers. Egbert was on friendly terms with him. His wife often did cleaning jobs around neighbours' homes. One of the houses she did cleaning at was 25 Cromwell Street. I shudder to think what could have happened to her being in that house, and it gives me chills to this day when I remember how we almost went with my father. Would Frederick have tried to do something to me if I'd been there? I was just a child at the time, and it terrifies me to even imagine what might have gone through his head if I had been with my father. Another thing that scares me to this day about all this is how this guy seemed completely normal to Egbert for all those years. Even the time he raped, killed, and buried his own teenage daughter under the patio of his house. My father too said though he only spoke to him very briefly, Frederick didn't come across as menacing at all. It strikes me as ironic when I think back 
how afraid of that shooter guy my mom and I were, and thought we'd be safer with my dad, who, while on holiday, crosses paths with the serial killer without even knowing it. 5. The following is an update to a story shared in episode 14. My grandparents' house was always very creepy and disturbing to be in. I've had many scary experiences in that house ever since my grandparents had bought it. I'm currently 16, turning 17 next week, and the house still freaks me out. So about a week ago, something weird happened. I was outside in the garage of the house with my mom, working on some painting projects, when something hit against a door to the inside of the house. Okay, I guess another circumstance, it could have just been the house shifting because of the wood. But this wasn't just a light thump. It sounded like it could have broken the heavy wooden door. I felt my heart stop at that moment, and I looked over at my mom. She had a horrified expression on her face. We locked eyes and just stared at each other for a few minutes before she decided to check it out. When she started moving, I whispered to her, Mom, what are you doing? She only looked at me and put a finger to her mouth as a signal to be quiet. Now, my mother grew up in a pretty awful neighborhood and knew how to protect herself if there was a robber. But I knew that that was no person. When she tried to open the garage door, it turned out to be locked from the inside. She looked at me confused because when we left the house the other day, I had left it unlocked. We both agreed to go around and go through the front door because that was the only one we had a key to. But just as we were about to go, an ear-piercing scream rang through our ears. It was as if it were nails on a chalkboard, except 100 times more intense. Needless to say, we got the fuck out of there. I honestly don't know what is going on in that house. But my mom is very spiritual, and she actually does think a demon resides in that house. She refuses to step foot anywhere near it until the psychic she hired comes and helps us figure out what's going on. She should be coming this week, so I'll send another update when she comes. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Scary Subscriber Stories, Episode 15. Well, I think story number 4 really goes to show you that you never can tell. I mean, of course, anyone who lives in the UK uh, and was, well, was alive in the 90s will remember the headlines, you know, body after body being discovered, killed by Fred and Rosemary West. Awful things, especially their own child. But you can never really tell who is a monster. Most monsters just don't look like them. And hell, oftentimes the really weird, creepy looking people you'd expect to cause you trouble. Nicest people you could hope to meet. I mean, I've known people in life who have later turned out to be, well, vulgar. There was, I mentioned about the creepy driving instructor the other week, who had been touching up young girls that were meant to be, meant to be getting driving lessons from him. Uh, then there was also a guy I knew, and um, I'd been on, uh, how do I describe it? Uh, while you're looking for work in the UK, sometimes you'll be sent on placements. It's meant to get you experience, but really it's just to annoy the hell out of you. Anyway, I was on one of these placements, and there was a guy I met there. I quite liked the guy. Obviously, I won't say, say his name. We'll call him Mickey, for the sake of argument. And I got along quite well with Mickey, because we were both quiet fellas. We, we didn't really didn't play cards, you know. We didn't smoke cigarettes or anything like that. But we, so we just kind of chatted to each other and... That's how we got through the day there at that place, because it, it could be quite mind-numbing. And I learned, many years later, in fact it was only last year I learned this, that Mickey was into kids. Yeah. Uh, which is a heartbreaking thing, because I knew his mum as well a little bit. Because they used to actually be customers in the store I worked in, in the shop I worked in. And I'd see them together quite a lot. He was a bit of a mama's boy. Not a judgement, he was just a bit of a mama's boy. And his mum was a really nice lady, so I don't really feel bad for him. I feel bad for her, because she seemed to depend on him quite a bit. 
Well, like I said, you just can't tell anything, it seems, about anyone. Appearances are not to be counted on. Okay, and I'm going to end this cheerful outro now, so until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.